Welcome. Thank you for joining us for worship here at Aylmer Baptist Church. We pray that you will be spiritually refreshed and strengthened in your faith as we worship together. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and at the end of the service, the deacons and the choir will be leading a Lenten litany, A Little of the Light. Let us hear the word of God as it comes to us from Psalm 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my, may my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's bow together in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we have come today to give you praise and glory. Thank you for allowing us access into your throne room through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who willingly gave himself on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin. We praise you for your greatness and your majesty, and thank you that because of the greatness of your grace and mercy, you have brought us into, your family, into a family relationship with you through Jesus' sacrifice. We pray that in this time of worship, we will gain a greater appreciation of your, of your great love, and that in all things, you will be, receive praise and honor and glory. Make your presence known and be glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather together this morning, come thou fount of every blessing. chapter 16, verses 16 to 17, God says, No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord our God has blessed you. Tithes and offerings are a way of giving thanks to God for all that he has done for us, and as an act of worship, to recognize that he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Thank you for your contribution to his work here at Aylmer Baptist Church. May God bless you as you give. 
At the end of the service, you will see a lift, list of ways in which you can contribute to the work here at Elmer Baptist. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have blessed us so that we may be a blessing. Accept these tithes and offerings with our love and gratitude, and use both the gifts and the givers for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God. tell you a story about a little girl whose name was Karen and Karen was four years old and she was a very very uh, smart little girl she was very smart for her age she had walked when she was about nine months old which is a little bit early she was when she was two she could speak very well and she seemed to understand things that normally only older children would understand well one day Karen and her parents went to a, a store that had just opened in town and they were, as they were walking around through the store, uh, they, found, or they saw a beautiful bunch of artificial flowers, and something, something like these flowers. And uh, Karen walked over to that bunch of flowers, and she looked at them very closely, and then she sniffed them, and she cocked her head to one side, and she said, flowers, I think. She was a very smart girl, and she realized that while they looked like flowers, they weren't real. So she wasn't exactly sure what to call them. Now, sometimes people have called artificial flowers hypocritical, hypocrite flowers, because a hypocrite is something that pretends to be something that it's not. And a lot of times we find people who pretend to be things that, that they are not. Sometimes um, people... People think they're very smart, and they're really not very smart at all. Sometimes people think they have a lot of musical ability, but they don't really have a lot of music, musical uh, ability. Um, sometimes people think that they, they're the, they should be the boss when they really don't have a lot of leadership skills. It's very easy for us to find people that we could call hypocrites because they're pretending to be something that they're not. One of the worst kinds of hypocrite, though, or the pretenders, are people who pretend to be Christians. You know, there are people who come to church every Sunday and sit in a pew and they sing the hymns and they bow their head and they, and they pray and they pretend to, it looks like they're listening to the sermon, but they're really not a part of Jesus' family at all. They have never really taken the time to accept him as their savior. And if you don't take the, make the effort or take the time to actually receive Jesus into your heart by faith, you're not really a Christian because a Christian is not somebody who just goes to church. But a Christian is somebody who believes in Jesus. Have, uh, in, in John 1 verse 12, it says, But as many as believed in Jesus and received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. To them, God gave the power, the right, or the privilege of, become, of being Christians. You're not a Christian just because you come to church. Not because, or you're not a Christian just because you go to Sunday school, but you're Christian by faith. And so today I wonder... 
Have you ever asked Jesus to be your Savior? Is He really in your hearts by faith? Do you know you're on your way to heaven because of Jesus who is your Savior? Don't be a, a hypocrite. Don't be somebody who pretends to be a Christian, but receive Jesus into your heart by faith and know for sure that you are a Christian. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that, so thankful that you've opened the way for us to have a relationship with you through Jesus. We pray that each one of us will have that assurance deep within us that we have received Jesus as our Savior, and that we're not hypocrites or just pretending to be Christians, but they really, we really belong to you. Bless each of the boys and girls who may be listening to this and open their hearts to receive, to receive Jesus as their Savior, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 to 13. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shemi and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. Zechariah chapter 13 verses 1 to 6. On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day I will banish the names of the idols from the land and they will re be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. And if anyone will prophesy, their father and mother to whom they were born will say to them, You must die because you have told lies in the Lord's name. Then their own parents will stab the one who prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of their prophetic vision they will not put on their prophet's garment of hair in order to deceive. Each will say, I am not a prophet, I am a farmer. The land has been my livelihood since my youth. If someone asks, what are these wounds on your body? They will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior, Think that 
God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin when Christ shall come we shall go back to nation and take me home what joy shall be shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art and sings my soul my Savior Let's bow together in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we have come into your presence today in the name of your Son, Jesus, to praise you and give you glory because you are the only one who is worthy of worship. You are the creator of all things. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, eternal, unchangeable, and yet you are rich in love. We praise you that in your limitless mercy and grace you reached down to us in Jesus and forgave us of our sin and gave us the assurance of eternal life. We can never stop praising you for all that you have done for us. We can never stop thanking you for the love you have shown and are continuing to show us. We confess that we are not worthy of your love. While you created us, we have strayed from your standard of perfection. We find ourselves attracted and tempted by sin we confess that we often fail to live according to your word and your will. We often displease and disappoint you, and we recognize that we are unable to live for you without the work and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Forgive us for those times when we fall to temptation, and give us the strength we need to live in such a way that those around us will know that we have been transformed by our relationship with Jesus. We thank you for the way you provide for us. Thank you for our homes, our families, our friends, our church, our country, the freedoms we enjoy. Thank you for the way you provide for our needs. Thank you for healing when we are sick. Thank you for encouragement during difficult and challenging times. Thank you for comfort when we mourn. Thank you for strength when we feel weak. Thank you that you are sufficient for all of our needs. Thank you for the fellowship we experience with other believers in Jesus. Thank you that through faith we are brothers and sisters in Christ and can join in worship and praise together. Thank you that through Jesus we are brought into your family and have the privilege of calling you Father. We are blessed people. We pray today for those who are sick that they might find strength for every day and for healing. For their worried family members, we pray for encouragement and faith. For those who mourn, we pray for your comfort. For those who are alone, we pray that they will realize that you are beside them. For those who are enduring stressful times, we pray that they will find your peace. For those who are tired, we pray that they will find rest in you. 
We pray for the homeless, the refugees, the abused. Touch them with your love. We thank you that whatever challenge we may face, you are sufficient for our every need. We pray for those who serve as missionaries. Protect them and give them fruit for their labors. For the ministry here at Aylmer Baptist Church, we pray for growth and you will continue to be, that we will continue to be a shining light for Jesus in this community. And Michelle, as Michelle Belzile prepares to take up ministry here, we pray that you will inspire and equip him for the challenges that face us here. We pray for the challenges we face as a nation. So many have gotten away from acknowledging you and your word. So many people act as if there is no God to whom they need to be accountable. So many people are behaving in ways that are diametrically opposite to your will. So often we hear people say that good is evil and evil is good. We pray that as a nation we may be restored to a knowledge of you and be directed by your word. We pray for our leaders that they will acknowledge their own weakness and will seek your will as they make policies and decisions. We pray that they will realize how much they need you. Once again, we thank you for the great love you've shown us in Jesus. We've come today to worship you in Jesus' name. And now we pray for your blessing upon the remainder of this service, that in all things you'll be glorified, that we will be built up and encouraged in our faith. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I then shall live. Please listen to the words. Sing the long One of the many beautiful features in many parks or city squares are fountains. They seem, there seems to be something mesmerizing and calming about the splash of water. As Kim and I planned our, uh, our cruise to the Mediterranean a few years ago to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary, uh, one of the things I was looking forward to was seeing the Trevi Fountain in Rome. It was famous for its beauty. It's one of the must-see things when a person visits Rome. Now, just as an aside, it wasn't nearly as impressive as I thought it would be. The square in which it's situated is small, and because there were so many people, it felt a little bit claustrophobic. But yet, it was nice to be able to finally see it. When we lived down near Windsor, we would sometimes drive down Riverside Drive, and there's a fountain in the middle of the Detroit River that is quite quite impressive. Multiple streams of water shooting into the air. I remember visiting Disney World uh, many, many years ago and seeing the show that features uh, multi multiple fountains on timers lit up with different colored lights. 
and the, 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 mu the, the water seemed to dance with the music. It was spectacular, and if I ever get back to Disney World, I'd like to see it again. Perhaps you have seen fountains that, um, that fascinated you. They come in all shapes and sizes, and it's even possible to have a fountain in your own backyard. You don't even need to own a mansion. You can small, buy small ones at places like Home Depot. And fountains have been around for centuries. Uh, many of them are very ornate. Even the ancient Greeks and, and Romans had them. And it still amazes me that old ancient civilizations were able to design something that would shoot water out of, out of the spouts without the benefit of electricity. But somehow they managed. Well, during the season of Lent, we've been searching the Old Testament for pictures of Jesus. And the picture of a fountain is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we, of Jesus in the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 13, 1, we read, On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And even though this is the beginning of a new chapter, this verse really continues as a part of the prophecy of the coming Messiah that begins in chapter 12 and verse 10. And in chapter 12, it says, it's a prophecy that will span centuries in its fulfillment. And God says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. Sounds like a picture of Jesus to me. It's easy to see that it refers to Jesus who was pierced by nails and thorns and a spear and who hung on a cross. That is a historical fact. We read about it in all four Gospels. It's referred to many times in the writings of the Apostles. The fact that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions is one of the cornerstones of our faith. And we're thankful for what he was willing to do for us because we realize that he did nothing to deserve the cross. He suffered, he died in our place, taking all of our sin upon himself, paying the price we deserve to pay, and receiving the punishment we deserved to receive. We know that when the crucifixion took place, the people of Jerusalem, and even those from the tribe of Judah, cheered. They were happy to see the troublemaker receive the punishment they thought that he deserved. The majority of people, the majority of Jewish people in Jesus' day didn't honor him. But at some time in the future, when he returns in majesty and power, they will realize their mistake and they will weep. And God says in Zechariah that their grief will be as bad as that, as that of parents who lose their only child. When Jesus returns, those who mocked him, those who scorned him, those who crucified him will be devastated to realize that they crucified the Son of God. They will be inconsolable. But in the midst of the grief, God says that he will open a fountain to bring relief. He will open a fountain to bring relief. And the fountain will be Jesus himself. And Zechariah says that this fountain will cleanse from sin and impurity. There are many references to fountains in hymns. Verse 2 of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah says, Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. The hymn, I will praise him, begins, When I saw the cleansing fountain open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's wooing when he said, Wilt thou be clean? And another hymn that we often sing during communion services says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their filthy stains. And that one has already always disturbed me because uh, I can't think of anything more, unappe more unappealing than a fountain spouting blood. I understand the imagery but I just don't like the picture that it paints in my mind. But yet it is as though Jesus was, 
that Jesus' blood was gushing from a fountain to provide cleansing. And as we think about a fountain, I believe that we can see at least three ways that make it a good picture of Jesus. First, a fountain cleanses. A fountain cleanses. God says through Zechariah that the fountain he will open for Jerusalem will cleanse people from sin and impurity. Now, because a fountain is filled with water, it can be used to cleanse. I know that, that many uh, the city fathers would, would frown upon it, but I'm sure there have been many occasions when people have washed their hands or their faces or their feet or perhaps their whole bodies in fountains. Hopefully they, hopefully they won't use soap to, that would actually uh, pollute the water or cause the fountain to become a, a mass of bubbles, even though that's been done as a prank on many university, cam- uh, many university campuses. But sometimes city squares have, that have fountains as one of their features also have concession stands or wagons or carts where people can buy their lunch or a snack. And we know that food can be messy. Who of us has never had ketchup or mustard drip down our hands and our wrists from an especially messy hamburger or hot dog? Sometimes we buy sugary or, or, cho- or, or chocolate treats that can make our hands sticky or the hands of our children sticky. And if there's not a washroom close by, a fountain makes a good place to rinse sticky fingers. If there's no washroom, people will gravitate to where they can find some water. And if a fountain is nearby, they will take advantage of it. Now, I know there are uh, the, the many people will worry about bacteria that might be floating around in the water. And so nowadays, most mothers will provide some or have some sanitizing wipes in their, in their purses. But when you don't have something like that on hand, many people are willing to take the risk and use the fountain in order to get rid of the stickiness and the mess. A fountain might also be a good place to rinse something that is fallen in the mud or dirt, some, hopefully, hopefully nothing like a soother that you're going to stick back in a baby's mouth. But a fountain, the water in a fountain can be used to cleanse. Water is used to clean things. And Jesus, Jesus is a cleansing agent. In Titus 2.14, the Apostle Paul writes about the second coming of Jesus, and he says that as we wait for that great event, we are to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Then he says that Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. And further along in Titus 3 verse 5, Paul says that Jesus saved us through the washing of rebirth. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. To purify or to wash means to get rid of any faults or impurities. And Jesus is like a fountain of water that purifies human beings. The Bible teaches us that when a person comes to faith in Jesus, God forgives their sin. That wonderful verse, um, 1 John 1, 9, tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103, verse 12, tells us that God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. It can never be held against us again. God's forgiveness is total because Jesus cleanses us. Jesus purifies. I don't know about you, but, um, but there have been times in the past when, when I've owned dogs. Then they went outside and played in the mud or, or worse, and they came in inside dirty and often smelly. And I didn't want to pet them or cuddle them or play with them until they had a bath, until I'd cleaned them off. Sometimes it happened with our children. Uh, their children are very good at getting dirty. We have some, we have some wonderful pictures of, uh, of our children with chocolate on their faces or, or their hands. We have an especially good one of my son, Mark, sitting in a car seat after he'd eaten a chocolate ice cream cone. He looked really cute, but he was really messy. And I don't remember which was harder to clean up, Mark or the car seat. But while we loved them in spite of their dirtiness, we didn't want to hug them because of that dirt. 
we had to get them cleaned up before we were ready to cuddle again, whether it's an animal or our children. And the same thing happens between God and us. He loves us, but our sin prevents us from, prevents him from, from being able to have a close relationship with us. We have to get cleaned up, and Jesus is the fountain that can accomplish that task. The Bible says that everything must be purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Everything must be purified with blood. And so that hymn that says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, it's theologically correct. Jesus is the fountain that provides cleansing. We all need him. We're all stained by sin. We need the purification that only he can provide. The second thing that a fountain does, though, a fountain refreshes. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've seen pictures of people sitting on the edge of a fountain with their feet in the water cooling off. In other pictures, some people have, have cast off their inhibitions and they've actually been wading in the fountain and getting their clothes wet. Well, why would they want to do that? Because they were hot, they wanted to cool off, and sticking your feet in cool water can make the rest of your body more comfortable. You don't even have to actually get in the water in order to feel refreshed. Something about the splash of water makes us feel better. And some of us will have had the experience of, of standing near a fountain when a gust of wind blew some water that landed on us. If it was a hot day, it really felt good. There's something about flowing water that has a calming effect. It can relieve stress. And that's probably why backyard fountains and waterfalls are so popular. And Jesus is like that refreshing fountain. When we're tired of the struggles of life here on earth, he can renew our strength. He can give us the ability to go on. In Isaiah 40, verses 29 to 31, we read these encouraging words. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In these verses, God acknowledges that every human being who has ever lived had had periods of fatigue. Our bodies are not machines that can keep going indefinitely. We get tired. We need rest. Doctors say that getting enough sleep is vitally important to good health and well-being. So we go to bed at night so that our bodies can be recharged. But sometimes we get tired during the day. Perhaps I should say that we, we often get tired during the day, and it seems to happen more and more the older that we get. At least that's the way it is for me. So we need to be re-energized. And sometimes all we need to, be, need to do to be re-energized is have a drink of water. I wouldn't recommend drinking water from, uh, the, from a fountain in the park or a town square. But in buildings like schools, we often find things that are called drinking fountains where you can get a drink without having to fill a cup. And after we've had a drink of water, we feel refreshed, especially if it's been a hot day and we have been exercising. And God promises that when we are tired and weak, He will refresh us. He will give us strength to meet whatever challenges we may be facing. And he does it through Jesus, who is the fountain of life. I think that one of the greatest uh, remedies for fatigue and disillusionment in life is the knowledge that life here on earth is not all that there is. It would be pretty discouraging to undergo uh, pain and disappointment and discouragement here on earth and think that that's all there is that there's no hope that anything will ever get any better. But that's the way it is with people who don't know Jesus. They, won't have, they don't have any real hope for the future. But in Jesus, who is the fountain of life, he gives us hope. He gives us refreshment. He, gives us, he, he, will, 
take us through the difficulties and challenges of life and bring us to a wonderful eternity. In Ephesians 2 verse 12, Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus and he says that before, before they responded to the salvation message that he preached, they were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Without Jesus, people have no hope. Their only expectation is that they will get older and weaker, and at last they will die, and that will be it, nothing more. But for those of us who know Jesus, we have the expectation of a glorious eternity. Paul says in Colossians 2.17 that Christ is in us the hope of glory. Beyond all the struggles and the challenges and tribulations that we experience here on earth, we have the expectation of a wonderful eternity in heaven. Jesus has promised that he's preparing a new home for us, that he will come and take us, to, take us there. And because Jesus is building, us, building it, we know it will be a wonderful place. And I don't know what could be a greater source of refreshment and encouragement for tired people today than that knowledge, than that assurance. We all get tired of life from time to time. We wonder if, uh, if it's really worth a struggle. Well, with Jesus, there is hope. He is like a great fountain that refreshes. When I work outside uh, in the summer doing gardening or some maintenance on the house, I get to the point of craving a drink of water. I'm hot. I'm usually dehydrated because I don't know enough to drink frequently. And at that point in time, nothing sounds as good as a refreshing glass of water. And after I've paused and been refreshed, I'm ready to go back to work. And Jesus is like that. When we get tired and weary of life, he refreshes us with the assurance that what we have here on earth is not all there is. We can sing the, the truth of that wonderful gospel song, that while we walk this pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, will sing and shout the victory. Because Jesus is the fountain of life that refreshes. But then the third thing that we can learn about the fountain, our fountain, is that a fountain saves. Another beautiful hymn, Jesus keep, the, keep Me Near the Cross, says, Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. When, when we get a cut on our finger, one of the things that we do, first of all, is to go to the sink and wash the cut because we want to get rid of any impurities. We want to cleanse the wound because we know that a clean cut will heal better. We want to get rid of any impurities or germs or bacteria. We'll probably use some sort of anti antiseptic or maybe some polysporin. But washing is the, usually the first thing that we do. When surgeons perform surgery, uh, they're careful about making sure that the instruments are sterilized and that their hands and gloves are clean because they know that cleanliness promotes healing. In the past, it seemed to be that, uh, that there seemed to be the feeling that if you couldn't see it, then it couldn't hurt you. So there wasn't that much emphasis on cleanliness. But today we know that while bacteria and germs are too small to see with the human eye, they are very dangerous. And so during this current pandemic, we're told repeatedly what the, one of the best things we can do to stop the spread is to wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Well, the blood of Jesus is a cleansing and a healing agent. It heals us from sin sickness. It saves. We often sing the, the, the hymn, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. He saves us because his blood has the power to cleanse us from sin. God can forgive us on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus. The shed blood of Jesus is powerful. 
It flowed from his, the wounds on his body like a saving fountain. When we're washed in it by faith, we're saved from spiritual death, which is separation, and we receive the assurance of heaven. Without the fountain of the blood of Jesus, we were all like walking dead people. We may have appeared to be living, and physically we were, but we were spiritually dead with no hope of a relationship with God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God was forced to remove them from the garden and from fellowship with him. They were spiritually dead, and then their physical bodies aged, and eventually they died physically. But Jesus made it possible for us to be saved from spiritual death. We can be revived when we come to him in faith. We might, like, we might think of it like a man who's in the desert dying of thirst. He's literally hours away from death when he sees a fountain. At first, he fears that it's just a mirage, but he crawls toward it anyway and wonders if it's real. And wonder of wonders, it is real. And when he reaches it, he uses every bit of strength that he has left to raise himself to the lip of the fountain and takes a long drink. He's saved. And we were like that. We were spiritually thirsty. And Jesus is the fountain that offers us life, eternal life. When Jesus spoke to the woman at Jacob's well in Samaria, he told her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is the fountain of living water that saves us from our sin. Have you taken a drink from the fountain of, Je that, of Jesus that cleanses, that refreshes, and saves? Let's bow together in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that Jesus is the fountain that provides life and salvation and refreshment. Father, we pray that each one of us who has meditated on your word today will know that Jesus has saved them, has saved us, and that through him we have, been, we have received eternal life, that through him we have been refreshed and we have been healed. So, Father, thank you for this picture in the Old Testament of Jesus, the fountain. And we thank you now in his name. Amen. the events that led up to the crucifixion. Jesus had come to bring hope and light to the world, but at every step there were those who could not accept the power of the light. He came to meet the people's needs, but there were those who misunderstood the kind of needs that Jesus meant to fill. Because he would not do what they wanted, they rejected him. According to John, Jesus was teaching a large crowd who had followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. Jesus saw the large crowd of more than 5,000 men and asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all of these people? Philip knew that they didn't have enough money to buy even a small amount for everyone. But Andrew, 
Simon Peter's brother said, There is a small boy who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough to feed all these people. Jesus had the people sit and then took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people. He did the same with the fish. Everyone had as much as they wanted, and when the disciples gathered what was left, they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of barley loaves. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus could sense that they were about to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills to be by himself. Jesus came into the world to change it, not to be made to fit into some mold that others felt was right. When Jesus refused to be what others wanted, they turned their backs on him, and a little of the light that had come into the world was put out. Mm -hmm. 